that we want to share with you this morning is a song from the hymnal. It's hymn number 460. It is a remarkably beautiful song. We only can bring you the melody and the harmony. But I would invite you to get out your hymnals and follow along the beautiful words of Jesus. As water to the thirsty, so my God is. Church, Good Good morning. thank you, Dr. Bob and Sister Merlin. Our speaker for today is a pastor evangelist. He has a son that is also a pastor, and a daughter that is also a pastor, and a daughter that is also a uh, church church school teacher. And there's a brother that also is an evangelist. So they are a family of workers. He's been in our church some four or five years ago. That's what I've heard. And I'm so excited that uh, we can invite him again to our church to uh, have a full-scale evangelistic meeting come May 11th through June 9th. And with him, he will have the field school for our young ministers that are training to be a pastor from Southwestern Adventist University. And it is a privilege for us to uh, be chosen as the venue of these evangelistic events. And so as it was announced by uh, Sister Merlin earlier, all the uh, church board members and the leaders of our church uh, will have a luncheon meeting with our uh, evangelist. And so um, I know that he was sent by God in such a times like this. Amen. And we'll be praying for him and his team and we'll give him the time as he brings to us the word of life. joy to be here once again. And I notice as uh, you're coming in, I've got to remember your faces, and it's just a joy to be back. And, and uh, I look forward when they uh, shared with me that the uh, pastor said they'd like to have these meetings, and they invited me. I said, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad to come. I feel like a family. I feel like I'm a part of this family. And that's where you ought to be, in God's house. Amen? Amen. We are family. One big family under the blood-stained banner of Prince, Prince Emmanuel. 
Again, I want to share just a couple of things with you before I get into my message. We're looking forward to our series of meetings, and uh, we know that God is going to bless us in a, in a mighty way. There's no doubt in my mind. And when you came in today, you were handed a, uh, in your bulletin, most of you students received in your bulletin, that we need your help in the different areas. It's a list of different areas where you can be involved in and uh, how you can get involved in this series of meetings, whether it's in greeting individuals or, or ushering or helping with the tape ministry. Each one of you should have received one. If you didn't receive a little insert, when you go out, they have them on the table. But again, I want to encourage you to circle the area in which you'd like to help. Uh, some of you are leaders. You're going to be leaders in those areas. But we cannot have a successful series of meetings unless we work together. The church, there is no dichotomy. We are the laos of God. We are the people of God. No one is higher than the next person. We're all at the same level at the foot of the cross of Calvary. And so again, I want to encourage you, please, fill it out. Circle the area you'd like to be involved in. And when you circle that, they will make sure you give that little insert to your pastor or one of the ushers or one of the elders in the church. But we need your help. We cannot have a successful series of meetings without your involvement. Because they're not just the, the, the evangelist meeting. They're not just the pastor's meeting. They are our meetings. Working together as a team. Also, you are uh, given, in fact, I'm going to ask the, uh, the ushers right now, I think they're going to pass out a little card to you. And I want everyone to take one. This is going to be your card. It's called Project Andrew. Andrew brought Peter to Christ. Every time you see Andrew in the Bible, he seems like he's bringing someone to Jesus. Let me tell you, I want to be a modern-day Andrew, don't you? Bringing people to Jesus? Amen. Well, it's called Project Andrew, but actually it's our prayer warrior car. Our prayer warrior car. And I believe our ushers have them now. We need to have them begin passing them out, all right? I want you to pass these out. Ushers, right now, did we pass these out yet? Let's pass them out. Okay, most everyone got one. Fantastic. They're doing their job. But what I want you to do, when you get home today is to write one to ten names of people you know in the area. And I want you to pray for them by name. Pray for them every single day by name. Intercessory prayer is powerful prayer. And when you pray, you can be sure miracles are, are taking place. Miracles are taking place. And so, I want you to put names of those you work with, maybe you go to school with, those in your neighborhood, those who you would like to invite out to the meetings when we start in May. And every day you pray, the Holy Spirit will convict those individuals that when they receive the brochure, when you give them the brochure about the meetings, they will want to come because you've been praying for them for the last five months. God is going to do the miracles. God's going to use you. So again, I encourage you, put those names down. When you think about the different individuals, you pray. You might think that, well, that David next door, that person can never... Never accept the gospel. My friends, never say never with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. My life is a testimony to that. Jesus Christ reached in the back alleys of Brooklyn, New York to save not just one young man named Richard Allison, but a family that knew no God. And God touched and God changed. And so again, you pray for them. Intercessory prayer is powerful prayer. You mark this day, sign it. And, and, and uh, you put the date on it. An individual shared with the early service how she put names on it. And, and, at the, and when we had our service here uh, four years ago, she said two of those individuals were baptized. Praise God. Amen. And I know that many of you had others that put your names on there. So again, be a prayer warrior for God. God's going to bless us as we work together. Later on, uh, Pastor Rodell is going to share with you a, a special... Uh, we would like help in, in getting some beautiful Bibles we're going to use during the seminar, and he'll pass that out for pledges, and he'll do that later on. But again, I'm glad to be here. It's nice to be in the sunshine of El Paso. Back where I live, we're in six foot of snow. So I like it being where the sun is shining, and there's enough to walk through that snow. In fact, I begin a series of meetings in, in Phoenix, Arizona, beginning Friday night. So you see, I'm staying as far away from the Northland as possible. But pray for those meetings, okay? It's actually Apache Junction out of Phoenix, Arizona. So pray that souls will find a Savior during those meetings. Once again, it's a joy to be here. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for everyone that's here. Each one is a son 
a daughter of your eternal kingdom. And Lord, we come to lay our burdens today in your feet. Not only lay a burden, but give us a burden that we might go out and share you with others. Lord, today I ask for miracles. Because you are a miracle performing God. Some are hurting that walk through these doors. I pray that you might heal their hurt today. There are others that have been knocked down by the battles of life and, and feel discouraged and depressed. Oh Lord, I pray you'll breathe new life into them. That when we leave this place, they will be encouraged with confidence. That we have nothing to fear. We are the children of God. Sons and daughters of God. Royal blood flows through our veins. And so today I pray, oh God, that you'll touch us. That you will revive us. In Jesus' name I pray and praise. Amen. Amen. It was a cold, cold fall morning in New England. The trees paraded their richest colors. I love visiting New England in the fall. It is spectacular. They, they, the trees paraded their, their rich colors like a proud peacock. And, and they were gold and scarlet and yellow and red. Telling that summer would soon end and that winter would appear. The leaves reflected off the old stone wall with that magnificent beauty. And in the stillness of the morning, I pulled my sweater a little closer to my chilled body. I, I looked down and looked over an old wooden bridge, looking out across a very ancient battlefield. Guns silenced by time. They stood like sentinels amidst these white monuments to men. Twas on that bridge. Twas on that bridge that arced the flood. Twas there the, the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard around the world. Lexington and Concord, April 19, 1775, the Revolutionary War began between Britain and America. From behind every rock and every tree and every hill, men and boys blasted away at the British. They blasted for independence. They blasted for freedom, for liberty, they died. And now, as I looked across that battlefield, all I could see were white monuments, white tombstones, where once young, brave men had stood. You see, my friends, there's nothing so remorseful, so depressing and sorrowful than a, a battle, a war. And here amidst those gravestones, as I saw these monuments, I saw the, really the, the fruitlessness of war. I stood looking at row after row of tombstones, one after the other. And all I could think of, as I visited various memorials around the world, all I could think of, all I could think of was, could you imagine these individuals could live again? I think of all our ancestors around the world who shed their blood for freedom. Those in the snowdrifts in Valley Forge, or those on the walls of Fort Sumter, or perhaps the bloody fields of Gettysburg, or Chickamauga, on the beaches of Solano, or Normandy, or, or Omaha, on the sands of Okinawa, and the bare bleak hill called Porkchop, and Heartbreak House, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the list can go on and on where a million or more of your countrymen and my countrymen have died. I think of all the soldiers around the world from different countries who have shed their lives and they have these memorials, these white tombstones. I thought, if only they could live again, what an army, could you imagine what an army it would be? If these dead corpses could come to life, what an army it would be. If they could live again, miracle, in a graveyard. Ezekiel, the 37th chapter in Ezekiel, verse 1. The Bible says in the 37th chapter, verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley 
which was full of what? Bows. Filled with bones. And caused me to pass by them around about. And there were very many, many in the open valley. And these bones were very dry. Verse 3, and he said, can these bones live? Can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Thou knowest. In fact, in verse 4 it says, he said, he prophesied unto those bones. And say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5, thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Notice verse 6. Notice verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring upon flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So we see the picture here that Ezekiel has painted for us. What a picture. A picture Israel is pictured actually as a graveyard. A valley, not just a small graveyard, a big graveyard, full of bones, dead man's bones. Her glory is buried in a pile of dust, a pile of bones. Israel, no longer the great nation that God intended her to be. And Ezekiel cries out, can these bones come to life? Can these bones live again? In other words, he's saying, is revival possible? Is there not hope for a resurrection? Can life and enthusiasm be born? Is evangelism possible? Can these bones live? Let me tell you, it's a cry of God's church. And let me tell you, as I travel around North American parts, various parts of the world, I hear the same cry. I see, I, see, I see what Ezekiel saw. Dead bones. Dead bones. Lots of dead bones. The big church in the city, the small church in the country. And we cry out as Ezekiel, can, can these bones come back to life? Can these bones be alive again? Because they were very dry. They were very dead. God's people, how sad. Sitting around. In visionless valleys, while well, thousands go down into crisis graves. And my friends, that's what our meetings are all about. It's to share good news with someone else. And let me tell you, we have the greatest news to share, do we not? Jesus is coming soon. I want my brother, I want my sister, I want my neighbor, I want my family to know that he's coming soon. I want them saved in God's kingdom. Amen? As I said earlier, we have good news. And if we would share the good news, yeah. as fast as we spread the gossip and all the rest, yeah. we're probably in the kingdom of God already, wouldn't we? Yeah. It is good news. Yeah. God has asked us to share good news. So we don't need to sit around in visionless valleys. God wants to use you. We need your support in these meetings. Being a lighthouse. And I thank God that here's a church that believes in evangelism. And the, and the leadership that went forward by faith said, we want to have these meetings. We want to share the message. It may be the last evangelistic meeting before Jesus comes. We don't know. Time is running out in the hourglass of prophecy. But again, God wants to awaken us. God wants us to do great things for him in the world we live. But again, all that he, Ezekiel saw were dead bones. Dried bones. Whitened by the sun. Picked clean by the vultures, cursed for that a cure, so it seems. Our bones are dried, our hope is lost. And so we see the helplessness and hopelessness of man. Again, you go, can these bones live? God, you know. God, you know. You physically, they were dead. The scientists cried out, they are dead. The doctors cried out, they are dead. The church leaders cry out, they are dead. Impossible. They cannot come back to life. Impossible. Bold letters across church bulletins. They are dead. Written across the tombstones. Impossible. Have you ever heard of such a dumb, dead audience in all your life? <laughs> he's preaching to bones. They're dead bones he's preaching to. 
But I want to tell you, my friends, with man, maybe it is impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Amen. Nothing is impossible. From dust to bones, from flesh to life, to revival in a, in a graveyard, thou knowest, O Lord. For you see, God has the blessings of the bones in mind. And the glorious bone maker, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to the rescue of the bones. If you want to know the bone of the matter, it's found in verse 2 and 11. The bones were very dry. And it says they were not only dry, but the marrow was gone. Let me tell you, have you ever felt that way tired? Have you felt out that you're worn out? You feel like you're worn out and useless because you're old? That you feel older than you, you really are? You know, someone handed me a note some time ago. I thought it was cute. It said, my glasses come in quite handy. My hearing aid is just fine. My teeth are just dandy. But I sure do miss my mind. <laughs> I don't know, those senior moments seem to come closer and closer together. But again, do you seem like you're battered by life? And, and Satan is trying to knock you off your feet. Perhaps your face is a little wrinkled and you're sad with life. But you need to understand God has a plan for your life now. We may be wrinkled, but God has a plan for your life. Moses was 89 years old when he led those stiff-necked, hard-headed Jews across no man's land. George Mueller. George Mueller, my friends, was 78 years old when he continued to preach around the world to millions of people. God has a plan for your life. Don't ever forget it. Don't feel discouraged and down, dry and dead. We don't need to feel this way because God wants to revive our bodies today. God wants to revive your life today. He wants to rattle those bones. He wants to breathe new breath into your body. You are not just dancing dirt. Here, to live here 70, 80 years, to live here, no. He's got a plan for your life. He is the potter. And we are his clay. He wants to use you now. He wants to awaken, awaken those sleeping bones. He wants those bones to be used as a blessing in the world we live in. God wants you and each one of us today to cry out, Lord, rattle. Lord, revive my bones today. Prophesy to the bones, the word says. In other words, God says to Ezekiel, you preach to those dead, dry, depressed, lonely bones. Yes. Preach to them. Yes. You know, sometimes God asks you and I to do the seemingly impossible. And sometimes we fail to see what the gospel can do when it's preached. Yes. I had a series of meetings of, about eight years ago in Zimbabwe, Africa. And I remember one night I gave an invitation to accept the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. And, and so many came forward. There was a fence. And that fence went down. They just kept trampling the fence and getting closer to the altar. I said, thank you, Jesus. I had the privilege to baptize, be a part of a baptism of a thousand souls for Christ. A thousand souls. If the, if the gospel can revive and save those there in, in, in Zimbabwe, Africa, can you imagine what it can do for us weak pagans here in North America? God's word can create miracles in your life, in the life of your family and your church. We need to leave God's house filled, filled, not chilled. The church must be revived. And how is it for the preaching of God's word? Hear the words of the Lord, ye dry bones. Ye dry bones. In verse 14 it says, prophesy unto the wind, and I shall put my spirit in you. So here is the secret of power. You want your bones to be revived? You want to come back to life and be a fireball for Jesus? Then my friends, the secret is a Holy Ghost revival. The Holy Spirit to shake us, to rattle us that we're alive for Him. To rattle your church, my church, 
You see, we're either going to have a revival or we're going to have a funeral. For, for me personally, I hate funerals, don't you? I hate funerals. No, a revival will only take place when we allow His Spirit to fill us, to engulf us. A Christian without the Spirit is like a skeleton without meat. We need God's Spirit. And again I say, if miracles are to take place in your life, in the life of God's church, we must ask for His Spirit to fill us and overflow us. So that the miracle in the, in the boneyard, the miracle in the graveyard, can take place. You see, what good are skeletons if they, they can't fight any battles, battles? Skin must cover their flesh. But still, that is not enough. It is still a valley filled with dead bones. They have eyes and cannot see. They have hands but cannot fight. They have feet but they cannot walk. What must happen? God's spirit must, must be poured out upon those dread, those dead, depressed bones. You heard right. Not only are they dead bones, not only are they dry bones, they're depressed bones. Depressed. Notice verse 11. Our bones are dry. Our hope is gone. In other words, your confidence is gone. Have you lost confidence in yourself? Have you lost confidence in your church, in your God? Have you lost confidence in your family? And your hope seems like it's gone? Don't give up. Don't give up because God has not lost confidence in you. God has plans for your life. For God has the answer to our dry, dead, depressed bones. There's a bright new day coming. Hallelujah. That's the good news to Ezekiel. That's the good news to you and I this day here. For God does his greatest work. God does his greatest things to those who are willing to trust him. Willing to get out of their comfort zone and to step out by faith. And put your hand in the hand of Jesus and get involved in, in every area of this church. For he alone, let me tell you, he alone can turn your, your mountains into miracles. He alone can do it. He alone can revive your confidence, your old dreams. And you can live again, really live again. Those bones of yours can come back to life. Those bones that maybe were depressed. Those bones that maybe were dry and dead. They can come back to life. But you know, they're not only dry. They're not only dead and depressed. But you know what? You'll notice they're lonely bones. <laughs> lonely bones. Verse 11. Our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. And we are cut off from our other parts. Lonely bones. Not only dry, depressed, but very lonely bones. And verse 2 says there were very many, very many, many, many lonely bones. You know, we can have a big, big church. We may have a, a big, bustling church. And it can be full of activity. But listen carefully. If it isn't the right kind of activity... All it will be will be a big rattling graveyard. Making a lot of noise, taking up a lot of space, but then we can have a whole lot of business going on. But my friends, listen, don't confuse it with blessings. We can have a whole lot of busy bopping bones gyrating all over this church, gyrating all over the city. But if we're not sharing Jesus with others, if we aren't helping lonely people find Jesus, we are nothing but a dead, dead corpse. We can have a thousand committees. A thousand committees going this direction, going that direction. But my friends, again, they go in a thousand little circles, going nowhere in a big hurry, drying, dying upon their feet. We can have programs, again, that entertain, but my friends, if they aren't programs that proclaim Jesus Christ, we don't need to have those programs. I thank God again for this church and for its vision to see what God can do and through each one of you as you dedicate yourself to be a prayer warrior for Jesus Christ. Because again, it's what God wants for this church. You see, bigness is not bad. 
Think this is not bad when those many, many bones are rattling for Jesus. The glorious good news, God can awaken our dead, dry, depressed, lonely bones if we let him. And he can do it today. He can do it today for you. Ezekiel says, Lord, can these bones live? And he saw the miracle take place. He saw lousy, lazy, dead bones become blessed bones. He saw those bones become the blessed bones that God had intended them to become. That God had created them to be. Look at the miracle in verse, uh, verse 7 through 10. They lived, it said. Right before his eyes, they lived. They stood upon their feet. And there was a great, great army. Miracle in a graveyard. Flesh, tendons, muscles, life, action. Divine energy breathed on those dead bones. And inanimate tissue became living tissue. And there was a great army. A great rattling took place in that graveyard. Remember, we are not just a bag of, 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 of dusty, dry, depressed, lonely bones with clothes on. God wants to revive our bones today. He wants to put some life into our bones, some flesh on our frame, some muscle on our skeleton. Power into your life. And He can do it today if you're willing to take divinity's diet. Divinity's diet, what is that? It's prayer. Prayer. Prayer leads to true revival. Prayer is the dynamite of the soul. Is the dynamite of the church. Dynamite in your family. And that's why I say to individuals, I meet them all around. They say, my son left, my daughter went here. They left the church and left God. I said, don't give up. You pray and you pray because your words are not bouncing off the walls. They're bouncing to the throne of God. And God can bring them back. Amen. I've seen him bring them back. Thousands upon thousands. God can do it. God can do it. You see, prayer is not only a place to lose a burden. I just got my friends a place to get a burden for a lost soul for Jesus. Perhaps your brother, perhaps your sister. There's someone in this community that needs to know Jesus. If you can encourage, if you can pray for, encourage him and bring them out to our series of meetings when we begin in May. Digesting God's word, we are armed for victory. Witnessing, you know what that is? Yeah. Witnessing, that's the real meat of the matter. Yes. That's what our meetings are all about. Yes. That's the flesh and the bones. That's revival in the church. Yes. And if we don't spend time sharing Jesus with others, we're going to die. Yes. The church will die. Yes. It is only as we share and give do we ever really, really get the blessings of God that intends for each one of us. Yes. If we don't pray, if we don't pray, if we don't study, we don't witness, our church will become nothing but a crater of corpse. A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. <laughs> revival, remember this. Revival is an experience in the church. Evangelism is an expression of that experience. A miracle in the graveyard took place because you know what? Ezekiel was captured. He was captured. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit and sent me down in the midst of the valley of bones. He was captured. It means to be seized by the Lord. Just a, 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 about two months ago, two or three months ago, I was in England. I had a chance to go to, to Norway and, and, and spend time in England and, and, uh, and to have a series of meetings in, in Finland. But there in England, I, I'm always fascinated by the English policemen. You know, they are called the British Bobby. And what's interesting, he doesn't carry a gun. He just carries a long, long stick, and they call him the long arm of the Lord. You don't like that, don't you? And, and you know when a crim criminal is caught? He don't start shooting. <laughs> no, when a criminal is caught, the British Bobby cries out, I capture you in the name of the Lord. I like that. We need to be captured by the Lord. We need to be seized by the Lord. If we're to have a true revival in God's church, if we're to do great things for God, to be captured is to be seized by God. It means to be filled with His Spirit. To submit ourselves to a higher authority. 
the authority of God. Jesus must be Lord of our life. He must have first place on your priorities. If he doesn't have first place on your priorities, he has no place on your list. And if he isn't, it will be nothing but a bag of dead, depressed, lonely bones. He will cause us to die. We must again, I say to you, allow the Spirit to catch us, to carry us, to grip us, rattle our bones. So that this city, your city where God has placed you, your neighborhood where God has placed you, your job where God has placed you, He's placed you there for a reason. That you might share Jesus in whatever gift you have, and you have a gift. Whether it's sharing a, a Bible study, whether it's preaching, or whether it's just giving encouragement, that's a gift God has given you. And God can give you a miracle for sharing that gift with others. Let's let our community know that we have a Savior that is alive. Let us let this city know that we are rattling, not just rattling, but we are gyrating, we are running with the good news of salvation all over the city. Amen. I say it's time for us to come alive, what do you say? Amen. I say let's do the work God has called us to do. And I say better do it badly than not at all. I commend you what you're doing and what God has in store for you. But again, these eagles say, can these bones live? God says they can live. Again, you need, need to understand this is your valley where God has placed you. And it is your it is your bones, it is my bones. God has given us a backbone, not a wishbone. He will breathe new breath in you. He will put skin on your bones, tendons on your muscles, for he alone can bring life to those dry, brittle, depressed, lonely bones. He can alone bring revival to our church, and if revivals will take place, it must begin with you, with me. He alone, alone can cause the miracles to take place in the graveyard. The word says, not the word, but a powerful poem. Notice what it says, breathe on us, O Lord, O breath of life. Come sweeping through us, revive thy church with life and power. O breath of life, come cleanse us, renew us, fit thy church to meet the hour. O wind of God, come bend us, break us, till humbly we confess our needs. Then thy tenderness remake us, revive, restore, for this we plead. Come breathe within us, renewing thought, mind, and will. Come, love of Christ, afresh to win us. Revive thy church in every part. Yes. Create a miracle today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, this is your church. These are your people. Sons and daughters of your kingdom. And Lord, we pray for that outpouring of your spirit now. Revive us, O oh Lord. Where we have been lack, Lord, increase our faith. O oh Lord, help us to get on fire for you. Lord, I pray that each person today have been revived through your spirit. That, that from this day forward, through the grace of Jesus Christ, they'll witness for you in the gifts that you have given them. That when our meetings begin, they'll be involved in the different areas. They'll lead out and be involved because they want to be a part of sharing good news with the city. So continue to bless them and strengthen them. Leave this church this day as new men, new women, boys and girls, as we lay our sins at the feet of Jesus. Thank you for your miracle today, the miracle in the graveyard, the miracle in our life. In Jesus' name I pray and praise. Amen and amen.
but never thy presence. Lord, be with us, bless us, and witness for you as you revive our bones. This day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and have a blessed Sabbath.